Eric, thank you for those kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for your words of introduction, Dr. Griffin. Thank you for yours, uh, Mr. President. In fact, the, the other President Hollande, the one I have to deal with on my side of the Atlantic, could profitably learn from you both in terms of content and brevity. <laughs> it's wonderful to be in this beautiful state. It's been a, a fantastic conference. There's nothing so important as transmitting the values that make a nation what it is. Teaching people to value their birthright. And the centre, and indeed the university more widely, are doing that job wonderfully. So anyone, uh, if there's anyone in the audience who is involved with supporting or sponsoring the work, thank you. You should be told that more often, especially by politicians. You're generating the ideas that all of us uh, draw from. You probably won't get it from another politician, so remember this moment. Thank you. I appreciate it very deeply. And the theme of privacy, of personal freedom, of civil liberty, what could be more appetizing? In fact, in a way, uh, there's nothing for me to say after the A Man's Hope is His Castle speech that Rick quoted from James Otis. It's, if you like, the foundation of the whole concept of individual freedom as understood in English-speaking countries. On both sides of the Atlantic, indeed. As you were quoting Otis's version, I was remembering uh, a similar sentiment expressed by Pitt the Elder, arguably the greatest uh, Prime Minister of his time. There's a wonderful scene in The Simpsons at Moe's Bar where there is an argument between Barney uh, and Carl, I think, uh, or whether Pitt the Elder or Viscount Palmerston is the greatest ever British Prime Minister, and they have a huge fight. Well, it, 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 I mean, they're both good, but the elder, especially when you uh, think of his version of James Otis's uh, stirring phrases. He, he, he said, The poorest man in his cottage may bid defiance to all the forces of the crown. The roof may be broken, the storm may enter. The wind may howl through, the rain may enter, but the king of England may not enter. Not all the forces of the crown may cross the tenement of that ruined household. And isn't that the basis of personal freedom? The autonomy of every individual, the ability of all of us to make relationships based on contract, on freedom, rather than on inherited status or uh, subservience to a greater legal authority. I want to talk this evening about how unusual that property is. How unusual historically and geographically, how lucky we are to be living in a place and at a time when the individual is elevated above the collective rather than the other way around. And in order to tell that story, let me take you back to a warm August day in 1941, a day when President Roosevelt made the longest walk of his presidency. Twenty years, in a way that would have been unimaginable today, the media had contrived to disguise the fact of the president's polio from the electorate. Photographs had shown FDR either standing unaided or sitting. But on that occasion, he walked. He'd been invited by Winston Churchill to join him for a conference on the deck of HMS Prince of Wales. His advisors were horrified. They said, Mr. President, it's a ship. What if the deck pitches and rolls? What if you end up in an undignified heat? But Roosevelt was determined to rise literally to the occasion. And as the band of HMS Prince of Wales struck up stars and stripes for it, it wasn't a unique to UVU to have the idea of these uh, Anglosphere patriotic songs. He made his way, supported by his son on one side, leaning heavily off his cane, and by a naval officer on the other. And what followed next was the most vivid and moving expression of what it is that the English people, the English speaking peoples, had in common and what they stood for almost alone at that time. Roosevelt has spent his presidency inching the country towards an intervention that was forbidden in the Constitution, or certainly explicitly forbidden in a number of laws that had been passed in the 1930s. He'd been uh, making available military collaboration, allowing the Royal Navy and Air Force to use bases. He'd 
overseeing the land lease agreement, and he'd done it broadly with the support of the American public. Partly, of course, this was a consanguinity of doctrine. It was the support of one democracy for others. Hitler had occupied a series of other parliamentary systems in other countries, in Scandinavia, whereas Nazi Germany and its allies were, of course, dictatorships. But Churchill knew that it wasn't enough simply to appeal as one democracy to another. He had to show that there was a deeper affinity, a deeper relationship between the two English-speaking powers of the day. And what followed that Sunday morning was designed to elevate and ennoble those ideals. Because it happened to be a Sunday morning, the two crews, that of the USS Augusta that carried FDR, and that HMS Prince of Wales, were paraded alongside each other for a religious service every aspect of which had been personally overseen by the Prime Minister. The stars and stripes and the Union flag were draped over the quarter. The hymns were carefully approved. One of them had been played at the funeral of John Hammond, a fiery champion of parliamentary supremacy who fought and died in the English Civil War and who inspired the patriots in the 1770s and was indeed taken as the name of one of the first US battleships. The language used in the liturgy was taken from the King James Bible, revered in both countries. Even the reading had been chosen by the Prime Minister person. came from Joshua 1. As I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. I will not fail thee or forsake thee. Be strong and with good courage. The Prime Minister was exultant. It was a great day to be alive, he later told the country in a radio broadcast. And at the time he expostulated it, his unwillingness, he said, the same language, the same hymns, the same ideas. Now to take those three ideas as my explanation of this evening of what it is that sets the interesting democracies apart. Let's start with the same language. Language is, of course, the usual denominator of nationality relate to people when we understand them. It's an obvious point, but it doesn't become any less true for being obvious. There's a neat illustration of this in a letter written by a former Rough Rider to his former commander, then Vice President Teddy Roosevelt from the, uh, the South African War, the, 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 the war between uh, the British Empire and the Boer Republics. He wrote, Dear Teddy, I came here intending to fight for the Boers against the British, because I had been told that the Boers were Republicans and the British were monarchists. But when I arrived, I discovered that the Boers spoke Dutch and the British spoke English, so I'm now fighting for the British. <laughs> it's, it's, not a, it's not hard to understand the reasoning there, is it? I mean, we, we kind of, we naturally feel that similar affinity. I've experienced it, I mean, in my own life, I remember when the Falklands War began, people divided almost entirely linguistically. I, I was born and brought up in South America, and overwhelmed. Spanish-speaking countries, including Peru, where I was living, were, uh, as you would expect, making a, an alliance based on being able to share the jokes and the nuances and all the subtleties that go with a single tongue. In Europe, the outlier, the one pro-Argentine uh, state was, of course, Spain, which is exactly what you would expect. The United States, then, under, under Ronald Reagan, went about as far as it could without entering the war as a belligerent in order to support Margaret Thatcher. And I think it's fair to say that the Gepa had public opinion behind him. There was a vote in the Senate calling for an immediate Argentine withdrawal, and 99 senators voted for it. The one who voted against was so contrary that he voted against almost everything. I don't know if anyone can guess who it was. <laughs> Jesse Hunt, exactly. Uh, I, I don't know how much you can redeem that. But the point is, people didn't identify with one side or the other on the basis of being in the OAS or the European Union or the old world or the new, they identified, of course, with the people with whom they had that sense of kinship. There may even be more to it than that. There's a fascinating theory kicking about that languages lend themselves to the expression of particular thoughts. Any of you in this room who speaks another language will know that when you switch from thinking in the one to thinking in the other, your perspective fractionally alters. Even if you use words which literally mean exactly the same thing, the, uh, 
the charge attached to each word is not always the same. And it may well be that the spread of free democratic values is not unconnected with the concurrent spread in English as the first truly global language. Uh, Professor Malapat Nau uh, from uh, uh, Manipur University, the chair of the UNESCO uh, uh, Peace um, uh, Committee, has argued that the best way of preventing the rise of extremism is to teach people English. It leads to a different kind of thought process. Now, I don't know. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a philologist. But it's an idea that strikes me as not completely important. Robert Clairborn, who is a philologist, says that the peculiar characteristic of English is that nobody regulates it. Almost uniquely among European languages, ours has no academy. It has no definer of correct orthography. Everywhere else, the language is controlled by the state, in France, and Germany, and the Netherlands, and Spain, and so on. And Clairbon says, as the language, so the political culture is based on an intrinsic distrust of unlimited government power. I don't think that's true. Certainly, our language lends itself to the expression of clear, direct thought. When I work in the European Parliament, I sometimes have the uh, headphones on over one ear in order to improve my own language skills. And it is a, a not uncommon thing that somebody will make a lengthy contribution which seems to make enough sense in his own language, but when translated into English, it's so abstract as to be meaningless. Maybe our tongue is good at expressing the truth. Certainly, as I said this morning, we can claim the authorship of the early libertarian lexicon. The phrases associated with freedom were first expressed in English. Liberty of conscience dates from the 1580s. Uh, liberty, uh, civil liberty, dates from 1644 in John Milton's tract, Areopagitica. We have some pretty good lines in the tongue which I'm now speaking. Think of the most famous apologia for democracy ever uttered. Uttered almost exactly 150 years ago. We're getting close to the anniversary, November 1863, at the graveyard in Gettysburg. Abraham Lincoln lightheaded from an oncoming case of smallpox, spoke for just over two minutes, and he finished with some of the most famous words ever uttered in English. He ended with the hope that this nation, under God, would have a new birth of freedom, and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, should not perish from the earth. Now, here's the really extraordinary thing. Those words were not Lincoln's. His audience, 150 years ago, would have been primed to recognize the quotation as our generation typically does not. That phrase, government of the people, by the people, for the people, comes from what was probably the first translation of the Bible into the English language. And incredibly, they were written in 1384. In what other language could that thought have been expressed in the 14th century? The same language. Actually, talking of the first translation of the scriptures leads neatly on to Churchill's second criteria. criteria on the same hymns. The author of that first uh, translation the author of the original author of the phrase government of by and for the people was John Wick, sometimes called the morning star of the Reformation. And for him, that phrase, government of by and for the people, was one that had a political and an intellectual as well as a religious input. He made a connection which, again, was once taken for granted, but which our generation tends to lose sight of, between religious and civil liberty. As he emphasized the importance of the individual making his own decisions, reading the scriptures to himself, forming his own relationship, choosing virtue rather than obedience, so he saw that that had an automatic read across into how we would organize political structures, civil society. That tended, again, 
to set the English-speaking peoples apart from other countries. Religious pluralism was a very early uh, development in the English-speaking world. Not, not religious tolerance. That has existed in lots of places, including some pretty autocratic ones. But the freedom to proselytize equality for all religions now was something that was almost unknown in the rest of the world. And it became intensified as English speakers sailed across the Atlantic and planted themselves on this continent. The first great migratory wave from the British Isles to this part of the world was, of course, driven by a quest for, above all, religious freedom. And this state was settled by an even deeper intensification of the same phenomenon. You might say that here you get the purest form, the purest, strongest distillation of Anglo-Sphere exceptionalism. <coughs> the people who came the furthest first to the US and then uh, across the plains to Utah in pursuit of freedom, the ability to live your life without being told what to do by the authorities. And that's really what Churchill meant by the same ideas. It takes a real mental wrench now to see the world from the perspective of August 1941, when Roosevelt and Churchill sat next to each other and spoke about having the same ideals. They were not making some bland generalization about being the good guys. Consider the world as it looks best. All the things that we consider to be normal and comfortable and moral, free elections and jury trials, and an uncensored press, and equality for women, and uh, regular polls, and all of those things were pretty much confined to the Anglosphere. The whole of the Eurasian landmass, from Brest and Lisbon to Vladivostok, was under one form or another of authoritarian regime. It's so easy to take things for granted, to think that there was something inevitable about the rise of freedom. Nobody saw it in those terms at the time. Look at the way that Anglo-Saxon liberalism, as its detractors called it, was described in communist and fascist propaganda between the wars. They always use the same adjectives. It's rotten. It's decadent. Then the coming idea was thought to be state action. Collective organization was thought to be more efficient and more moral. There was something supposedly diseased or, or selfish about a society where everybody did his own thing without needing to ask permission. Nobody would have assumed that there was something predestined about the rise of what we now take for granted as a free society. The biggest mistake our generation makes is to assume that when a country becomes rich enough and educated enough and advanced enough, somehow all of these things will follow. That is not the case. The spread of liberal democracy to a single approximation came about as a result of a series of military victories by the English people. There were three great global conflicts in the last hundred years, the two world wars and the Cold War. The list of countries that was on the right side in all of them is a short one. But it does include all the large English-speaking democracies. And that is our greatest boast. That was our supreme contribution to the happiness of the species. We made a world where the individual and the privacy that we were speaking about and the freedom of conscience became normalized. But don't think that once you've won that victory, that's it. That we can relax that there's now something inevitable. We're on a glide path. That's not how it works. To see how exceptional these values are even today, don't compare the United States with China or Russia. Just look at the other countries of what we call the West and see how different there is the conception of the relationship between citizen and state. We were talking uh, today, your president mentioned again now, the, the founders and the process that the US went through in formulating its constitution. You can do worse than to contrast that story with the European Union's equivalent effort a few years ago when I was uh, a newish member of the European Parliament. Your constitution is 
doing all of its amendments, 7,200 words long. The EU's equivalent, originally called the European Constitution, it's now called the Lisbon Treaty, is 78,000 words long. Your Constitution addresses itself to broad principles. What should be the relationship between state and federal authorities? The EU Constitution busies itself with the most tiny details. The status of asylum status. The role of the European Union in space exploration. <laughs> these, are all, uh, these are all things now set down with constitutional force. The presumption of one generation assuming that these things can be enshrined forever. There was a big row at the time about should there be a reference to Europe's Christian heritage? I mean, it's no wonder there was no room for the Almighty with the arrogance of the people uh, assuming that they could lay down these things in all time. I mentioned earlier the difference between the phraseology of Jefferson's Declaration of Independence and the EU's equivalent. One promises life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. The other promises strike action, free health care, and affordable housing. You see the difference. One is about the freedom of the individual. The other is about the power of the state. And you see also the difference in the mechanisms by which they were adopted. Your constitution came into effect following separate ratification in specially convened assemblies in the 13 member states. Well, 11 of them, I think, are the industry. Right? If I'm right uh, in remembering this, I think Rhode Island and North Carolina held out for it and then fell into line a little bit later on. Contrast that with what happened in Europe, where the European Constitution was repeatedly rejected in referendums by 54% of French voters, by 62% of Dutch voters, by 53% of Irish voters, whose objections were then swatted aside and the text was imposed anyway. Don't imagine that democracy is the natural end game for an advanced society. That's not how it works. In every age and nation, the people in power try and rig the rules so that they and their children get to keep it. We are exceptionally lucky to live in a place where that isn't true. And by the way, if you think I'm being absurd in making a parallel between your constitution and the European Union, I can only cite in my defense that the comparison was first made by the author of the European constitution, Valéry Giscard, the former French president, who at the founding convention, to my astonishment, I was sitting at the back, said, this is our Philadelphia moment. And they went on to compare themselves to Jefferson. <laughs> Where does one begin unpicking that paradox? <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you where you begin. You begin with point made both by Dr. Griffin and by the president, uh, the president with a rather obvious point that Jefferson wasn't there. He was uh, uh, President Jesus. I might have been expected to know ambassador to Paris at the time. But, but the exceptionals of our story, and by our, I hope you'll gather by now, I mean the three English speaking peoples, is something that we can very easily turn away from. It's the most natural thing in the world to take familiar things for granted, to become blasé. You don't know how lucky you are. Where I work, I see the alternative every week. I see countries that have a very different attitude to the rule of law, to free contracts, to property rights, to democracy. I see how, what outliers we are in a European system where the needs of the state are thought to outweigh the dots and commas of the rules, say, let alone public opinion. We are made different by our institutions. That's the real thing. The founders knew this. You look through all of that correspondence, you don't find any sense that America is special because of some magical property in the Rocky Mountain, or in the Mississippi water, or in the gene pool of the people who crossed the Atlantic. It was the institutions that they believed would make this republic different. Jefferson did once eccentrically write to a friend in France, your skies are always cloudy, ours are always blue. <laughs> Perhaps one took down to an understandable excess of patriotic exuberance, or perhaps to evidence of massive climate change. <laughs> <laughs> but he envisaged correctly that there would be a huge stream of people crossing the Atlantic this way, and that the return fare would be a much less popular one. Now that came true beyond the dreams of that generation. 
but they never thought that there was anything other than the institution that stood between the American dream and what the rest of the world did. They were convinced in their bones that any other country that applied the same principles would enjoy the same freedom and happiness. But the reverse is also true. If you move away from that constitutional inheritance, if you become more like the rest of the world, if you start undoing the unique characteristics that set this country apart, see how long it takes before American voters start behaving like French voters or Greek voters or any other angry, demanding, spoiled, coddled electorate. And when I say undoing the peculiarities of the Constitution, I mean transferring power from the 50 states to the federal capital. I mean shifting jurisdiction from elected representatives to unelected officials to czar. I mean, how, how did anyone think, given the story of the foundation of this country, that czar would be a suitable name to give a federal official? As that happens, as power becomes centralized and more remote, so you get the corruption, the waste, the duplication, all of the things that begin to create a separate political caste, cut off from the people it's supposed to represent. And again, your third president foresaw this as well. In a letter, he said, opposing the idea of a strong federal government, he said, a government at such a distance from and out from under the eye of its constituents cannot but succumb to corruption, blunder, and waste. Brilliant description of what's happened in the European Union. But it's also a scary picture of what could happen here if you go down the same road that we have. I've been a member of the European Parliament for 15 years. I'm living in your future, or at least the future on which your present administration seems determined. I'm telling you, my friends, you're not going to like it. And I say this with particular feeling as a British conservative. I meant it when I said that this country was the strongest distillation, purest form, of our peculiar notion of personal freedom. Your founders didn't see themselves as inventors, as innovators, as radicals. They saw themselves as conservatives, taking up arms to defend the freedoms they assumed they had been born with as Englishmen. They traced the history of those rights back through the Glorious Revolution, back through the Great Charter, even to the folk right of Anglo-Saxon common law, which John Adams called the supreme monument of human power, common law of England. And those precepts reached their highest and most sublime form in the little secular miracle that took place in the old courthouse in Philadelphia. That's your heritage, and vicariously that of all the English speaking peoples. You can imagine how I feel when I see it being abandoned here. The last time I was in the US, I was in the Northern California in a wine growing area. And I was struck by an almost irresistible <coughs> metaphor. The wine in California had, of course, originally been brought from European vines, from French, Italian, and, and Spanish stock. But the ancestral vineyards were almost wiped out in the 19th century with a plague called the Philoxera blight, a kind of aphid that echoes. And so the wine growers of Europe in the 19th century, in order to restock their vineyards, had to come to California and take cuttings back to the ancestral places where they've been brought from and begin viticulture again on the basis of this weak importation. Now, it was always my dream that we should do something similar. That those elements of English liberty that have withered in the mother country that have flourished here could be reimported like those clippings and the lines. Imagine how they would have felt. Those viticulturists of the 19th century, when they arrived here, they found that the plague had got there before them, that the egg was already on the leaf, and that there was nothing to take back. 
That's why I talk with particular feeling when I say, cherish your inheritance. Respect the principles of your founders. Safeguard the greatest constitution designed by human intelligence. Keep intact the privileges that you were lucky enough to inherit from your parents and pass them on safely to your own children. Never be afraid to speak to and for the soul of this nation, of which, by good fortune and God's grace, you are privileged to have.